Welcome to the Mayor Baba program. I'm Fred Stankus with my guest Suhas Ramgindi. And we're from the Mayor Baba Center here in Southern California. And we're presenting this program on Mayor Baba's life called Gems from Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor is a, a volumes of autobiography of Avatar Mayor Baba's life. We're going to be covering the years 1927 and 1928 from Lord Mayor Volume 3 which covers the years 1925 to 1929. In these particular uh, eras of 1927 and 1928, Meher Baba gave many messages, and one of them is, which I think is remarkable, Suhas, and that is the belief in God. Can you um, turn that to page 879 in volume two, uh, which talks about what Meher Baba has said about believing in God. I'll be glad to, Fred. Um, there was a music program going on in the afternoon and two sadhus arrived unexpectedly whom Baba welcomed very lovingly. And in the middle of the program, Baba stopped the singing and wrote out a long discourse. He was at that time writing on, on a slate. And Baba says, to believe in God and say that God exists is not hypocrisy. But to say, I am God, without the realization, is absolute hypocrisy. All faith is based on intellect, and there can be no faith without intellectual conviction. Things beyond the intellect cannot be understood by or through the intellect, which is finite and limited. Before trying to grasp the beyond, beyond everything, or trying to get an intellectual idea of it, one must first acknowledge that the state of the beyond is, or that it exists, that it does absolutely exist. That is the first step before one can approach the infinite and boundless. For example, we do not, we do not know who or where God is, or whether he really exists or not. However, to understand or to have an idea of God and his works, as explained in religious books and by the wise, we must first take it for granted and believe that he is, that such a superior being as God does exist. With that beginning and trust in him, start in search of him. Do you want me to continue next or you want to? Yes. Okay, well he says, he continues on and he says, the people of the world, the masses, do not really believe in the existence of God. They merely fear God as some unknown mighty being who rewards the good and worthy and punishes the wicked. And it is this punishment of hell created by God that they fear more than God himself. For if they really believed in him, in his existence, and were afraid of him, their behavior would be quite different from what it is today. Dishonest, selfish, deceitful, and wicked. If they really felt afraid of God, they would be ever alert not to do anything that would displease him, or that he would not like. If they really trusted in God and believed in his existence, they would at once begin looking for, looking for him, and would never rest until they found him. For when love for him comes, fear of him vanishes. And when that love reaches its zenith, the lover finds that he himself is the beloved. And he continues on and says, no progress on this path is possible if a person is an atheist and does not believe in the existence of God. If all people were to follow atheism, there would not be any progress on the road to truth. But being inwardly a disbeliever and outwardly showing oneself to be a believer is the lowest form of hypocrisy. The belief that is gained through intellectual knowledge given by one who is realized is devoid of any hypocrisy and such a belief is a help in advancing toward the goal. And. Uh, that was that statement. So you met Baba when you were a young man? A young man in, um, in 1965, yes. And then you came to the U.S. and went to the UCLA? US. Yes. And uh, 
you uh, lived in Los Angeles for how long? Oh, from 1966 on, that would be about 34, 35 years or so. And so your father was a surgeon in India, and he yes. met Baba. He met Baba. And so indirectly, that's how you met Baba, through your dad. Through my dad. Uh huh. And what made you come to the United States? Well, I came here to study, get myself a higher education. I went to UCLA and uh, did studied engineering. And I got into some other business activities. Uh, so, wouldn't you say is Maya or the, I guess, illusion stronger in India or in the United States? Or is it is it Maya just a relative thing? Well, Maya is universal. It's just as strong here as it is there. It's 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 what creation is all about. It's also something that people identify with. Uh, it makes us identify with the falseness, which is which, what, which is what people take to be reality. What we see externally all around us, that is due to Maya. God mixed with Maya creates the creation, not Maya by itself. But what we have to learn to do is to extric extricate ourselves from Maya and focus on to the reality, the ultimate reality, which we essentially are. It almost sounds like for the ultimate challenge you, <coughs> you decided me. to come to the West mm -hmm. to challenge yourself to see if you could overcome the attractions, allurements of the West with its material life, with its great uh, pleasures, with its uh, uh, cuisine, its, uh, mm -hmm. its, uh, its all of its pleasures. And, and for say, are you somewhat uh, living in this society sort of like a yogi <laughs> in order to maintain yourself? Well, you might say in a sense that I've tried to be sort of, uh, I was always involved in the mystic or the something that was other than worldly. And I try to focus more into that realm. And also, you might say yogi in the sense that I'm doing exercises like breathing, meditation. I do a bit of everything, but nothing at one time. Well, it leads us to this page 881 uh -huh. about Baba was saying, mentioning what real yogis could do with their yogic powers. Uh -huh. Mihir Baba explained their source of power as electricity or an electrical cosmic energy. Can uh -huh. you pick up on that? Okay, I will try. Um, <clears throat> Baba says about what real yogis could do with their yogic powers. So he says, or he said at that time, there is electricity in the air and it has seven layers. Seven layers? One inside the other. Just like there was, seven... There was electricity, uh -huh. the power that lights our light bulbs, runs our TVs, yes. is coming from a source that is evident in the universe, and there are seven layers of electricity. Yes. One inside the other, meaning it's, it's all mixed Interwoven. Up. Yes, interwoven. <clears throat> and the power that the yogis make use of comes from this unlimited source of cosmic energy in the air, from the third layer inside. Mm -hmm. They combine the limited source of energy in their own body with this unlimited cosmic source by means of breath. The combination of these two powers enables the yogis to bring about whatever result they desire. The yogis only have to think after combining these forces, these two forces, the limited and the unlimited, and by certain yogic practices they achieve results such as raising the dead, reading other, other people's minds, seeing things at a vast distance, and so forth. For example, says Baba, if a yogi wishes to raise a dead body or see certain places in America while sitting here in India, by yogic practices, he has only to combine the sources of energy within himself with that cosmic energy which is in the air. <clears throat> that done, the yogi has only to think of the particular desire he wishes to fulfill. But on the other hand, a perfect master, a one who is realized, a realized being, does, ha does not have to exert himself in breathing or by exercises as do the yogis. 
but has only to think as he wishes and he achieves the result. What does it matter to the perfect master if someone is dead or alive? To him both are equally false, uh, as both are mere dreams or illusions. The world is as he wishes, which is not the case with yogis. To them the conditions that exist are real and have therefore to change from one thing to another as they desire, sort of like a transmutation. And it is for these changes that yogis exert themselves in performing different spiritual disciplines or sadhanas, meditations and exercises. Although the powers they attain are tremendous, they are after all only rays of the sun and not the sun itself which is the perfect master or the Sat Guru. So being a yogi is definitely just a, you could say you're on a stage of spiritual yes. progress. You're definitely having you're a... You're on the way. You're yes. on the way. Uh -huh. And uh, probably takes quite a bit of uh, practice to achieve this yogic power. Yes, of uh, course. Discipline. Um, well, you have to be at a certain stage to achieve, to do these miraculous things, so to speak. So in other words, what you're saying, it's not for everyone, and a given lifetime, I mean, after a lifetime of, of practice. Yes. Uh, of, 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 in other words, is, is yogic powers then, is that achievement called grace, or is it actually just a practice? Well, they're basically a lot of physical and mental disciplines. Hatha, the different types of yogas like hatha yoga and breathing except pranayamas, things like that. So in other words, a yogi doesn't um, waste energy or doesn't, uh, uh, like for instance, uh, sexual relations, a yogi most likely would stay away from that. Yes, he that? tries to conserve his energy to re retain his energy and therefore to gain what they call uh, Siddhis or occult powers, uh -huh. and these powers come by spiritual disciplines such as meditation, concentration, so breathing techniques. And, and he also would probably not eat meat because of the uh, yeah. impressions of the animal that would con con condone yes. uh, lust to They pass anger. on. Uh -huh. So that's basically, what is your take on why one should not eat meat? I mean, you do eat meat, I know you do, but I'm saying though, in the purest sense uh -huh. uh, of the spiritual, you know, uh, experience, why would one choose not to eat meat? Well, Baba said that when you eat meat, you can also grasp some of the impressions that the animal has. Although some people said you might want to eat fish or chicken more than, I would say, beef or mutton. By meat, I would mean red meat. I rather see. than fish or chicken. I see. So those impressions could have a, a lasting They can effect. transfer onto you and that can lead to other uh, impressions of... He talks about the lower desires like lust and greed and anger. And so if you, if you have more of a vegetarian diet or if you eat more fish, chicken, which have less impressions, because these forms are on the lower order of evolution than the animal form, mm -hmm. Of course, the human being the ultimate form in evolution before involution starts. But Baba, on page 818 here of this uh, uh, Lord Mayor, volume 3, said, okay. Baba distinguished between Maya and Sanskars or impressions mm -hmm. on 819. Okay. He said, Suppose you are assailed by anger, lust, and greed, or uh, any bad emotion or feeling. Uh huh. He said, This is Maya's or illusion's work. Exactly. But suppose you feel hungry, thirsty, or sleepy, uh -huh. which is due to sanskaras or impressions. Right. If you eat, drink, and engage in innocent enjoyment, it is not wrong because these are necessary to life. Yes. But if you become overpowered with any bad attacks from illusion or Maya, then you have to drive them away saying, go away, go away, get the hell out. Uh -huh. There's nothing for you here. Right. So, can you uh, expound on that? Or as, I, as it speak for itself? Well, I would say uh, what you just read was that some of the emotions that come out, they can create impressions. But if you do your daily ne necessities like uh, eating, sleeping, going to work, and uh, and drinking and so on. When you're engaged in activities that your body needs to do in a natural sense, 
then that does not create impression because you have to live your life as you go through this, through the different phases of life. Mm -hmm. But when you get involved with the emotional aspect, such as when you get angry, or you have you demonstrate lust or greed, then those things create impressions and those are harder to remove than the natural uh, activity of a human. You know, on page uh, 820, I don't know if you wanted to cover about the 56 <coughs> de, uh, number denoting perfection or how God uses Maya mm -hmm. to conduct the affairs of the universe. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, because that's sort of going along with what we're talking about. Yes. Do you want to sure. quote what Baba said about that? Okay, I would like to read a little bit and yeah. then maybe give a little bit of uh, insight if I may. Uh, Baba says uh, on June 30th, uh, he said, uh, he was explaining this, this to his closest disciples, Amandali. He says, God uses Maya to conduct the affairs of the universe. Paramatma, which is the highest form of God, uh, never uses Maya to make others free from Maya. And then he demonstrates this by saying, suppose Arjun, this is not the Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita, but the Arjun who was one of his disciples says, suppose Arjun is Paramatma and is keen as God, his stick. If you wrap a seven colored string around this cane, that string is Maya that's wrapped around the king. What a difference between Arjun, the, the human, and the string. The string has only touched God, the king, and not Paramatma, who is aloof. Suppose you come along and mistake the string for a snake. This mistake creates Maya. But if you see that the string is only a string and nothing else, then where is Maya? It is only a false supposition that is really Maya. In the end, when it is found that it is only a string, you laugh at your false presupposition because your fears are gone. The illusion is removed in the same way when one attains realization, he laughs at these false notions of Maya. The world and all its connections, for they are totally false and not real. Therefore, the very moment Maya, such as desires, passions, and anger, enters your head, thrust it out. Do not let it in at all. If a rabid dog goes after you, you shout to drive it away. If, on the other hand, you give it food, it will follow you and will not go away. Similarly, Maya is like a rabid dog. Do not allow it to enter your mind. Drive it away as you would a mad dog. Drive it away with all your strength, for once it sticks to you, it will be quite impossible for you to free yourself. And when people say that God created Maya, but that is not so. For example, take the hair on the head. The hair is Maya and the head is God, the Creator. Although the hair grows on the head, the, the head does not know how, why, and where it comes from. And how can it be said that the head created hair, or God created Maya? But in a way, the very creation of Maya itself is dependent on God. So Maya is sheer illusion, the force of imagination. Where there's lust, there is Maya. Where there's anger, there's Maya. Where there's greed, there is Maya. He who renounces Maya finds everything. Do not be a slave to Maya. Subjugate Maya and you will see God in all his perfection. But it is next to impossible to realize God. One must die, in quotes, to gain this state. Not by drowning or committing suicide, but by renouncing Maya and freeing oneself from its deluding allurements. And this Maya is so tyrannical and powerful that even the best of persons succumbs to its lures. The real heroes who eat her up are very rare. So hold tightly to my feet to ease your way or else you will get, not even get a whiff of reality and your strenuous efforts to reach the goal age after age will not bring you any nearer to it. And uh, that was an explanation. So it's quite a tall order then. 
for most of us yes. living in the um, physical world and being, you know, an influence daily by what we hear, what we listen to. And so it takes a strong mind, a strong will to, uh -huh. to basically, you could say, combat Maya. Yes, and also that's why Baba talks about focusing on on the on the image of of a deity that you take to be uh, something that you can focus on as a uh, as a god or a personal god, and when you focus on that constantly as a form of meditation, then some of these entrapments or allurements of Maya will sort of diminish or lessen. So that, would, that is one of the ways of overcoming that. Now, when you're speaking now, the thought just comes across mm -hmm. my mind. What would the person who has a, a real strong Christian belief feel about what Maya is? Because to them, a person from the Christian path would say something in the regards, I rely totally on Jesus' teachings in life and I surrender my life to him and I... He governs my whole life, so why do I have to worry about what is Maya? Yeah, but in the Western world, Maya and illusion is represented in, in Western culture, in the Christian culture, by the devil. So you illusion. Say, so you'd say the yes. devil is what is is what Christians would well, refer to yes. Maya. Yes, devil is in the Christian faith would would be uh, anything other than the practice and teachings of Jesus. That's where Satan is, is Maya, it's the other in Buddhism, the other, other than the ultimate So in reality. Buddhism they call it the other. Yes, I and see. in Christianity they call it Diabolos, or the devil, or the other. And that is what takes us away from God, takes us away from what we really are and gets us caught into so are you saying the devil exists, or is that just well, this a, is it's a symbolic thing? To the people that talk in terms of religion, they talk in terms of devil as something that exists, and they can paint a, uh, a image of him if they want to, but that is not the way it is. It is a principle of illusion. And so that one, we're, we're talking so about. one following the Christian path, if they are following it with their whole heart, sure, in an like honest they, way, they focus on Jesus. So that's that's a wonderful path, of course. And so one following the Islamic way, with focus the, on Muhammad, is, is another. Yes. Uh, do they uh, have a devil also, or, or not? Ah, uh, yes, they do, because yeah. Islam comes from uh, Judaism and Christianity. That those three faiths are intertwined. Uh huh. And then, the same root with Abraham. So in Hinduism, it's Maya. Maya is the explanation of how creation came into being. Mm -hmm. God mixed with Maya is the creation. Maya also makes you believe or gets you involved in the world, in the affairs of the world. Once the thing, you identify with Once the thing Mihir Baba said, God's shadow is Maya. Exactly. In other words, the reality is his the true reality form, is his true form. And the shadow that the he shadow is Maya is is what is this creation exactly. So that so creation to a God realized human or a person, creation is like a shadow. It does not exist. It has no basis of reality to him, and that's why the perfect masters can effect miracles and so on by just wishing. The way this is being discussed is as though there is hope for everyone because a given lifetime is only an incident in mm -hmm. a certain amount uh, in, in, the, in the existence of, of a soul. Sure. I mean, so in other words, one lifetime of, of pain and suffering or joy and pleasure are all passing. And yeah. the, the, the true goal, as I see we're down to about two minutes left, maybe you could give us some idea of what a soul or a person should more or less think and aspire for. I mean, mm -hmm. if they if they're feeling that this lifetime of theirs has been rough, it's been they've been beset with illnesses, financial loss, mm -hmm. family loss, or haven't been dealt a good hand as far as vocation. So, what would you say to that soul? Well, they have to go through life because they they go through life because of their previous impressions. 
sanskaras. So we have to now talk in terms of reincarnation. The soul, which is one, indivisible and eternal, takes on forms. It's sort of like how you take off your clothes when you go to bed at night and you put on a different set of clothes. So when you go to sleep at night, they say you wake up in the same body the next day while you're in this life. And then when you pass away, you wake up in another body. So that's what reincarnation does. And the reason you take on another body in your next life, or in the next life, or in your previous life, is because of unfulfilled impressions. They were not allowed to be exhausted, and they need to be experienced. And because of that, we take on a human form, and then we go through life experiencing these impressions. But once they're experienced and exhausted, these impressions called sanskaras, then uh, we don't have any need to be born in that type of a situation. We may be born into a different type of situation because new sanskaras or impressions are created as we go through this life. But when you come in contact with a perfect master, should you have the good fortune and you deserve his grace, he can wipe all your sanskaras off and then you become realized. He can get that realization in a flash of an instant. So you're saying everyone's goal mm -hmm. is eventually to be one with God. To merge with the ocean. Which everyone that will achieve, achieve yes. that eventually. That is the whole purpose of creation. We I come see. from that and we go back to that, but it may take a long, long, long period of time. Well, I see that our time is up now, Suras. Thank you for uh, sure. sharing with us here on the Mirababa program. Mm -hmm. This is the end of part one. Part two will air next week. For more information about Avatar Mirababa, contact the Mirababa Center. Until next week, this is Fred Stankis for Suhas Ramgindi. Thank you. Chai Baba. Chai Baba.